So hello and good morning and welcome to our 2024 Cyber Threat Landscape webinar. My name is Callum Kluwer and I'm Head of Managed Services here at GHM and I'm joined today by Martin Lethbridge, who is a Senior Sales Engineer at our security partner of choice, WatchGuard. So what are we going to cover today? As titled, we are going to go through some of our, what, what we believe, uh, top cyber security threats uh, that we believe will pose a risk in 2024 and also how we can defend against these threats. We will then allow, if we've got time towards the end, possibly five to ten minutes at the end of the webinar to cover any questions that might get asked. Um, so if you do have a question throughout the webinar, please just pop it into the Q&A above. Uh, it is the question mark just above or to the side of my head. Uh, I'll pass you over now to Martin, but as I said, I will join you towards the end um, if we do have time to cover off any of the questions that are asked. So thank you and enjoy. Over to you, Martin. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Lethbridge. I work for WatchGuard, as Callum has said. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background who I am. I've been with WatchGuard 14 years. I'm a senior sales engineer. Uh, senior means I probably can have a nap in the afternoon. No, don't tell my boss. He'll probably tell me off on that one. I'm also a Wi-Fi ethical hacker, and I specialize in network security and Wi-Fi. So there's the areas that I specialize in. Um, but obviously with uh, WatchGuard, we do many products, and I cover all of that. Who is WatchGuard? So WatchGuard was founded in 1996. We're about 1,200, I think it's about 1,300 now employees. We're based in Seattle, Washington, and we have over you know, 250,000 customers and we operate in seven countries directly present in 21. Uh, as you can see, we have a number of partners and one of them is GHM on that one, who are one of our gold partners. So today I'm going to talk about the UK uh, 2024 top security stats. And one of the first things that I'd like to bring to your attention is uh, one small business in the UK is successfully hacked every 19 seconds. Now, this is something that is a little bit alarming because most small, medium businesses tend to think that no one's going to go after them. And to see this sort of stat being bantered around is more concerning because obviously we need to up our game. We do a, uh, a, a, a report every quarter. Now, in, at the moment, the latest one I have is Q3 of 2023, and we'll be coming out with Q4 very soon of last year. And it tells us about all our endpoints, all our firewalls, telling us about the threats that we're actually currently seeing. Uh, the malware detection regions at the moment is, as we can see, it's an equal split between um, Americas and Europe on that side. But Asia Pac seems to have just peaked that little bit more. But we are predicting that this year, with the elections going on in America and in the UK, that that will peak a lot higher in those regions again. Endpoint ransomware is increasing by nearly 90 percent. But the biggest thing that we have to be aware of is that more and more uh, malware is being hidden by encryption, so coming in via TLS, via HTTPS traffic. And if you are not uh, inspecting that type of traffic, you'll never see that type of ransomware until it's too late. So we're advising to people that we need to start bolstering our security and actually making sure that uh, we're actually inspecting that type of traffic. So as you can see there, zero day malware, 69%. Um, 31% being uh, signature based. So that's something we have to be aware of that when you're dealing with your security and you're looking at your endpoints that you have and how you protect them, if you are using just an endpoint protection, I, what we call an EPP, where it's just signature based, you're only going to catch 30% of the actual malware that's going on. You need to be bringing up your actual security and using it so you can actually take, get the zero day stuff. So it's using something like an EPDR solution on that side. And then obviously with the TLS side of things, we're seeing 76% of it all being encrypted. So that's coming in via those lovely HTTPS pages or by links that are encrypted on that side. I mean, can anyone remember or find a web page that is not HTTPS? I mean, the BBC is pure HTTPS. Everything is HTTPS now. And just remember, those pages are encrypted, so you can't see them at the perimeter. So we need to actually look into them. Another bit of information that we're seeing is 87% of uh, the threats that are being run on the people's machines are done by scripts. So it's not a case that they're actually downloading files onto people's machines. They're doing what they call IOAs, where they're actually gaining control 
off the people's machines and they're running scripts using PowerShell to be able to gain that leverage that they need. So it does show that this is a more uh, going more and more the way on that side. And it also means that they're able to do this with, uh, you know, with uh, not just Windows anymore, because obviously with Macs and Linux and stuff like that, scripting is very easy to do. So with that, let's have a look at the top threats that we're seeing in 2024. So first off, spear phishing. That's still my number one. Spear phishing is still, in fact, it's been around since the 90s. It's not something new. In fact, it, you know, we have stats from people like Know Before that are saying that 91% of attacks were, you know, used against people with spear phishing. We're on a, or they're using automated social network reconnaissance. So we all have Facebook or, we, or Instagram or something like that. But how locked down do you have it? I mean, they are using that reconnaissance or social to actually identify who not only who you're friends with, but what your behavioral habits are and how they can actually leave that against you. Uh, they're also doing like brand impersonations and whaling targets and smishing those lovely SMS um, messages that we keep receiving uh, saying that your password has been left uh, and you need to pay a duty for it and stuff like that. I'm sure we're all used to them and we know not to click on them, but people still do. And then obviously with those uh, 90 to 95 breaches, start with that spear phishing. I mean, the, one of the biggest hacks was the Bank of Pakistan with over a billion dollars got exfiltrated by the Lazarus Heist Group. I mean, that started with a very simple email going, hi, I'd like to work for you, here's my CV. Someone clicked on that link, downloaded that uh, uh, um, PDF, and within there had a command and control in that PDF, and they basically were then able to access that person's machine. And then using that access, they're able to actually move from one machine to another machine for a whole year to be able to actually then get the final bit where they exfiltrated a billion dollars. Now, luckily, they only managed to cash in about 70 million of it, but luckily it sounds a bit daft. 70 million was still a lot of money. And prime example, if you we were to look at this page, could you spot the obvious problem here? And the obvious problem here is when you look at the URL, we can actually see it saying service manager 00bob.core.core.windows.net. And this is something that users might not realize, although they see the windows.net because it's on Windows and it's in there going, well, that's obviously the right domain, they're actually starting to put some of these um, uh, spear phishing websites inside the WatchGuard's, um, you know, uh, uh, areas. So it's very hard to actually work out whether it's good or not. Account takeovers. Now, account takeovers, I think, is going to move up uh, over the years. Why? Because it's turning into something that is going on preveniently. I mean, the first one was in 2002. And as we can see, the Sony PlayStation lost 77 million passwords back in 2011. And then 2019, there was 1.5 one, one to five leaks were of 22 billion passwords. Now, I've got more stats I could put in there and I could bore you and let's show you how they all go on. But the thing is, there's something that's going on preveniently. They're using things like the Mimi cats, the way that they can actually scrape data from, you know, RDP services. Now, luckily, um, people have got more wiser and they don't expose their RDP services onto the raw internet, or if you do, then you're likely to be attacked by something worth that sort of things. The other one is using 2FA. 2FA bypass with SMS is also an easy way to bypass uh, your security. Reddit, net got caught, uh, Red, uh, Reddit got caught out by that. And people like HSBC and stuff like that. I mean, it's so easy to do a SIM swap nowadays. I mean, how many of you have a Vodafone phone and how many of you know what your default password is for your account? Now you're probably sitting there going, I don't know what it is. Well, it is normally, if you haven't changed it, is your per birthday. Now, all you need to do is find out that person's birthday, phone up Vodafone, give them the right information, and you can actually do a SIM swap as easy as that. So we do recommend you change even those basic sort of things. And there's another thing, the evil proxy. Now, this is probably the one that I'm seeing a lot more prevalent out there. The evil proxy is where they're able to actually send a link to a user. The user clicks on the link and it redirects them to takes them directly to, you know, the office.com page where they can log into their Outlook. But what's actually happening is that the proxy is actually mimicking everything that it sees from the Microsoft site and it's scraping that information and then passing it to the hacker. 
And then a the hacker then not only gets the username and the password, but he also gets this thing called the session cookie. And that session cookie means that they can take that cookie straight away, go directly into a browser, go to outlook.com and refresh the page and they're in the person's Outlook. So that person may have had that Microsoft Authenticator done everything that you've told them to do, like make sure you don't click on it unless you're expecting it, and instantaneously the hacker is already in. This is something we're seeing constantly. In fact, we had a car dealership a few weeks ago where they actually were using our auth point beforehand, had actually decided not to carry on with auth point, and they were going to use the Authenticator app because it came part of their bundle. And then within three weeks, they were coming back to us saying that they had been hacked and they needed to go back to auth point. So this is something that is more and more that I think will go into being my number one in uh, by the end of this year for sure. Next one, fileless malware. Now I spoke about the Pac Bank of Pakistan, how they're actually able to get onto the person's computer. And this is something that we need to really stress, that your traditional AV will never catch this fileless malware. Why? Because it's fileless. There is no files for it to scan. This is where the hackers have now got to the point where they can actually get onto people's networks and they can move themselves quite easily from one machine to another machine by using the, what we call the living off the land. That's using things like the PowerShell that's built into all machines, uh, using other scripting and stuff like that, leveraging all these scripts to be able to give themselves better access to other machines. And then from that, able to compromise those machines, either to run something that will actually encrypt all the machines or to exfiltrate that data. And once they've exfiltrated that data, holding you to ransom to say that they will actually release it if you don't pay them. And that's the one that really scares me. The thing that someone can run something on someone's machine silently in the background and your normal endpoint would never pick it up. So with all that scary stuff, let's take a kitten break. Let's reset everything. I've told you all the bad things that are happening out there and how they can actually hurt you and what you can do. But let's think about the positives. What can we actually do to actually help to protect ourselves? And it's all about defending ourselves against the threat. Now, if I came onto this webinar and said, I have the perfect products that will protect you and all you've got to do is buy them, I'd be telling you a lie because there is no silver bullet. Security is something that you actually have to look at and work with a partner to build up a good security posture. Now, I'd like to think that my products are there to help to protect you, but it has to be implemented correctly. And that's what having a good partner is all about. So defense in depth. So defense in depth is not about having one thing. It's about having multiple things to, attack, to help to protect against multiple attacks or how the attacks happen. So first off, having a firewall is a good thing, but having different services to protect against it, like having the intrusion prevention, and then things like having the AV and reputational authority, and then APT protection, which is like the sandbox protection. So on the firewall side of things, all those security services are very much needed because not one thing will actually protect you. All of the things will protect you against multiple things. I mean, the prime example is like when the WannaCry hit the NHS. You know, we had five NHS trusts that use us with everything. Well, one didn't and they got infected, but the other four didn't. And the reason was our intrusion prevention started to help to protect and identify the WannaCry. And then our APT blocker, which is our sandbox, was able to identify and actually stop it as well. So be able to give that different levels of protection. Another thing, multi-factor authentication. Notice I say the word multi-factor, not 2FA. If you are using any form of 2FA, I'm afraid to say that is now dead. You need to be going forward. Now with our one, we're using banking grade. So it's all about something you know, whether it's your pin, password or your PIN, a token on the phone or a, you know, or a token and a finger thing to actually unlock it. So prime example, something I am, I am Iron Man is my password. Please don't use that against me. Something that you have, my phone or my token. And then we have a thing called device DNA. This is what actually makes a multi-factor even stronger. This is what Microsoft's Authenticator doesn't have. It identifies that individual token or that individual mobile phone that is doing the authentication. And if we receive anything from other than that, we'll just go, we're not accepting it. So giving it banking grade protection because the people like Barclays, and Santander, they use this sort of DNA on your apps that you use currently on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And then finally, something that you are, the fingerprint to be able to say, to unlock that code, to be able to allow myself in, I'm using some form of biometrics to actually make sure, or a pin to make sure that I can log it in so we can identify that person. And then finally, the ability to either log in via SSL VPN, or even to use it for Office 365, or to gain access to a highly sensitive area. That's what MFA is all about. And then finally, DNS phishing training. There was a stat a few, uh, about a year ago that hopefully you are all training your staff on how to spot phishing. It's that usual sort of thing. Once a year, you sit them down, you show them what phishing is and not what not to do. And then what happens afterwards? Well, there's a stat saying that 60% of users, once they had any form of phishing training, they instantly get tweaked by the knowledge of, oh, is that a phishing email? I know, let's click on it and see if I was right. And that's the problem. We've trained people to actually identify it. Some people have forgotten about it, so they just keep on clicking regardless. Or you have the people that are curious and going, hmm, I wonder, and then wondering whether they actually are correct or not. So here at WatchGuard, we have a thing called DNS Watch that is available on the firewalls. Uh, and we are able to actually intercept all outbound phishing uh, sites. So we don't affect any DNS that is inside the network. It's only when it goes outbound. And we have 32 feeds telling us about all the phishing sites that are out there. Now, if one of your users does accidentally or curiously click on that link to go, is that a phishing link? We then redirect them to this web page, but then we'll give them a five minute phishing training session. It's the best way to retrain those users to actually identify and say, hey, you clicked on that phishing email again. You need some more training. It's amazing how quickly that works on people. And then finally, probably the one thing that we don't talk a lot about, the dark web. Now we know the dark web is there. It's a place that is holding something like umpteen billions worth of unique email addresses, millions of unique passwords. And you need to be able to understand that this is a place that we need to make sure that we're monitoring. Now with our um, with our AuthPoint um, TIS, we have the ability to actually monitor your accounts and make sure we let you know that as soon as we see any of your credentials online, and if they are, if they are there to notify you and say, hey, the MD's username and password for the, his PayPal account has been compromised and something needs to happen. So this is where it's all about giving that proactive protection. So hopefully those few things that I've talked about will give you some insight to what we can actually do to help to protect you. And the guys at GHM are able to actually help to give you a better security posture because going forward, we all need that better security. Callum. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. I'll uh, just go to the Q&A now, see whether we have any questions. And we do. Uh, can we report on user activity using DNS Watch? Wow, now that's always a hard one because DNS <laughs> Watch is a, a service that sees things externally off the firewall. So at this moment in time on the firewall, all we'll see is the DNS traffic coming out from that your DNS service internally. And sometimes with DNS, we can tell you, yes, we saw this person or no, we can't. But there's things that are changing. We are now developing new ways that we've got a new service coming out in a couple of months time called Firewall as a Service. This is an agent that can be put onto people's machines where it can be tunneling the traffic all the way up to the pops and gives the protection using DNS, protect, DNS Watch as well. So then we'll be able to identify the users a lot better. So there's movements to give people better reporting on that type of things. So it's coming, it's in the next two months. I've got to say there's a lot of new stuff coming with WatchGuard. Callum's got, got a lot of learning to do this year. Sorry, Callum. <laughs> uh, we've got a couple of other questions and we do have time. Um, and we've got two questions that are kind of related to the same. Mm. Um, so I will ask, um, I have Microsoft Authenticator is this good enough? And the other question was, uh, so MS Authenticator isn't really enough? Yes, so Microsoft Authenticator, I know Microsoft has given CD the market and given it away for free, depending on 
what license you have depends on what security you get with it. Now, when I was talking about the evil proxy and how that can circumvent, I have a video on it that shows how we actually how it actually works and how scary it is. Um, Microsoft do say that this can be stopped um, from working, but you need to have something like an E4 license, which is like the top one, which is normally out of most small businesses reach. And then you have to do conditional access, but using certificates, which then requires every machine, every mobile phone has to have a certificate on it for it to even be able to uh, stop this from actually happening, which I think is nuts because they're now making their security more expensive and more unattainable to the people that really need to have it. And that's why I think actually using things like uh, uh, Microsoft is not great security because we should be using security with obscurity. I mean, to give you an idea, I went, I, I'm security cleared. I get to go and see the lovely MOD and stuff like that. And when I see them, they don't use what you'd expect them to use. They use different vendors. They use obscure vendors. Why? Because it's security with obscurity. That's what they believe in, because that's some of the ways that actually give better security. And that's why at WatchGuard, you know, we are in quite a lot of places because, you know, we give that type of security that, you know, you wouldn't traditionally get. And even for us at WatchGuard, we get hammered all the time and we get people trying to doing that same phishing attack against us all the time and every time they fail which is great for us because they expect us to be using microsoft authenticator and we're not so they haven't done their research but the good news is we're stronger so is microsoft authenticator good enough i don't think so because i don't believe in something that that marks its own homework as well mm -hmm. same thing i think about microsoft defender not the greatest i wouldn't trust it that's me the stuff we've got one more here i like this one it's probably my favorite is the is the talk about cyber insurance hype or should we actually consider it? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I think the lawyers are the probably scariest people. I, I, I do the events <laughs> with lots of partners uh, and they do, sometimes they bring the lawyer and the lawyer talks about, you know, cyber insurance and stuff like that. And quite a lot of the time the people in the room go, dude, I can't afford it. It's too expensive, you know, and the problem is we all have insurance for our building and our businesses you know, stopping it from burning down, from being broken in. How often do you have a fire or get broken in? Now, I'm hoping none of you have. I mean, that's the last thing I want. But the cyber is prevailing all the time. I mean, only on my own internet with my own firewall, I see the amount and number of IP addresses constantly hitting my firewall is unbelievable, you know, and it peaks and troughs. And they're just doing one thing, trying to probe if they can come through the front door. Now, if I had the same level of attacks on my front door, my ring doorbell would be going off about every five seconds. So I'm knocking on the door and trying to prize my windows open and stuff like that. So cyber insurance, yes, I do think it is very important, but it's not just because of, you know, you have to have it. I think it's because it's your reputation as well. Because if you get hacked and you are following everything that you're meant to do, they will pay out to actually make sure they get, you know, your data back, look after your libel costs and all those sort of things. So one of the key things I'd actually say is if you do go for that cyber insurance and you go for that cyber essentials plus, don't be the stupid person that says, well, we passed the exam, we got the insurance, I can now disable half of this painful stuff because they do come back in and audit you when the hack happens. And if you do have stuff turned off, I had a um, I was at a partner's, there was an event, and this customer that was there, he said, I did the stupid thing. I had the cyber insurance. I had did my cyber essentials plus plus. I was very proud of it, but the deep packet inspection was annoying the crap out of me. So I turned it off. Next thing is we had ransomware. So I called up the cyber insurance people. We've been had ransomware. They came in and did an audit and saw that I turned off the deep packet inspection. Instantly, they went, sorry, mate, we can't pay out. And he was left on his own. And I actually say, look, we need to actually be doing these sort of things because they have the power to give you the best people to actually try and get your data back. So I think, yes, and I'm sorry I've sold my soul to a lawyer, but no, I haven't. I'm just trying to be honest with people on that one. Good stuff. I think we've got time for, for one other, and there, there is another one linked um, to insurance, which you just covered. Um, it's a bit juicier. Uh, is the hype behind Gartner saying SMEs won't be able to get 
or will find it very expensive to get cyber insurance unless they use dedicated SOC. Are you aware of that? Oh, I think I think not a big fan of Gartner. I think the thing of having a dedicated SOC is very important. We we do offer, you know, MDR services and stuff like that. Look, I don't think it's saying that you won't be able to get it. What I think is, is getting to the point where you've got to look at, do you have the expertise in house to monitor what's going on? And if the answer is truthfully, well, I've got one man who liked computers and we gave him the responsibility that then you do need to have expertise looking after you. And I think having uh, people that are actually able to see the stuff in front of you, seeing it and able to actually react 24-7, 365, is a bonus. I think it's actually a very good thing. So I ignore what Gartner says. I actually say that we need to have this type of um, protection. We need to have the people that know how to do it because not being funny, I mean, us at WatchGuard recruiting the right people to actually monitor this sort of traffic and be able to see it is not easy because, you know, these these people are very special, as you can understand, but they really do know their stuff. Mm. Well, and it's like, you know, your stuff on your business, but do you know cyber? No. I mean, I can go back to probably back to the early uh, 2000s and I was hired uh, on a two, you've heard this Callum, I, I worked it for a company up in Canary Wharf and my sole job for two days was to sit there and monitor four firewalls and just look at their logs all day long, looking for anomalies. Can I just say that was probably the most boringest job I ever did, but nowadays things are a lot better and you know people actually have the tools to see what's going on. So, yes, I do think we need to be looking at having people that can do that sort of protection, do that sort of um, uh, be able to see what's going on 24 seven. So I agree with that, but I just disagree with Gartner how they say it. I think they're a bit mean. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, that is all the questions, Martin, um, we've got. Um, if you just go to the final slide. So if there are any questions that come up between now and perhaps later that you feel that you didn't have time to ask today, uh, please do get in touch. My email address is there uh, on the screen in front, uh, as is my uh, contact telephone number. So if any further information, any other questions, um, then please do do get in touch. But Martin, thank you so much for your time. Um, thank, thank hopefully you. everybody enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, take care, everyone. Be safe. There's lots of kittens out there. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.